So I was uh, definitely a an early adapter of mm-hmm. kettlebells when the one of the, the OGs. <laughs> yeah, we can say an OG of right. kettlebell when when the market was being created in America, right. going back to 2002. Mm-hmm. The first question that I have is, who is Steve Cotter? What does he stand for, and what is your main mission in life? It's actually three questions. Uh, I'm a I'm a peaceful warrior. I'm a warrior for peace. Um, I I essentially use um, fitness and health and well-being to mm-hmm. elevate humanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, first and foremost, through myself and the example that I that I live. Mm-hmm and to promote uh, proper education around the world to help people empower themselves. So what I stand for is, um, in a word, unity. And what I mean by that is um, recognition of uh, the value of every individual, Mm -hmm. uh, to include the animals, to include the earth, that we are part of a a global civilization Mm -hmm. that goes beyond uh, ethnic, uh, ethnicity, it goes beyond nations Mm -hmm. and uh so that's that's really what i'm about i'm a a martial artist and um the martial art is to be a peaceful peaceful warrior for good really yeah and uh uh, so my my role is to help individuals strengthen themselves through proper education Mm -hmm. of of biomechanics of healthy living and of well-being so how did you get started with kettlebells well, it was an extension uh, as a young boy, starting at 12 years old, my oldest brothers got me involved in martial arts. Mm. And so my first exposure to physical culture as a 12 year old was, was studying Chinese martial arts very religiously. And that was actually my first profession, my first uh, mm-hmm. career uh, was teaching martial arts and practicing martial arts. And so it was coming out of, of uh, being a martial artist and having an appreciation for holistic movement, meaning using the whole body as a unit, training the mind and the body together, that attracted me to the kettlebell when the kettlebell was a new phenomenon. So I was uh, definitely a an early adapter of kettlebells when the- One of the, the OGs. <laughs> yeah, we can say an OG of right. kettlebell when, when the market was being created in America, right. going back to 2002. Mm-hmm. You know, I came into it with a, a background of movement and a background in conditioning and flexibility through the martial arts. So it was sort of a natural- uh, Gravitated towards- Yeah, it was a natural yeah, yeah. Uh, segue into the, segue. the kettlebell yeah. with the yeah. use of, of the entire body as a system as, as compared to you know, what was around at that time, which have been more of like a bodybuilding type of protocol which separate where you're isolating body, muscles isolating, and trying okay. to sculpt the muscles. Uh-huh. Um, whereas the martial arts is more of a holistic, using the whole body as a unit and training movement. And so the kettlebell was an extension of that for me. And I immediately saw the value of it. Using the body as a whole. Do you think it is it is the right thing to sometimes isolate the body, or do you think it is the right thing to always use the body as a u- uh, as a unit? I don't believe in absolute, so I don't think there's any one thing that is always in every in every scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's general. So at least for myself and and my viewpoint, the isolation its value is m- most often going to be for rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, if someone has, say, a knee injury or a knee surgery, they may want to do isolation exercises to target that region. Mm-hmm. So that would be one of the most um, uh, general applications of, of isolation. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some cases, it may also be useful if you've identified a, a weakness, a particular, oh, you know, a yeah. weakness in a certain area of the yeah, body. Yeah. So if someone has maybe a, a weak shoulder or an injured shoulder, there is value in uh, certain types of isolation mm-hmm. movements to focus on that area. Mm-hmm. But as an overall training philosophy, I, I'm not a fan of isolation, mm-hmm. I believe. Mm-hmm. As an overall training philosophy, it's um, using the body as a cohesive unit. Yeah, but still saying that there are no absolutes, but sometimes you leaning towards one direction or the other so it's like for example if you say a bodybuilder who is training for a show and and, and it's like well we, we need the delts to grow a little bit more to match the physique that would be 
And yeah, a yeah. Way so you know, everything has to be in context, yeah. and um, you know, so we all have our our expertise. I have a certain a certain population that I'm work with. You know, in, in my practice is going to be more um, people that have a background, either either trainers or or strength coaches mm -hmm. or athletes. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in another setting, as a personal trainer, a lot of times a personal trainer would be exposed to general population that maybe are not coming from a, a physical education background. They're maybe working in an office. Mm -hmm. And so completely different uh, approaches. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but certainly, I'm not in the bodybuilding world, but certainly a bodybuilder, that would be a good example of mm -hmm. someone who may want to do isolation mm -hmm. to target certain body areas. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, I'm coming more from a martial art athletic uh, point of view in which the entire body is utilized as a as a in integrated unit mm -hmm. and so it's not so much about an individual muscle it's about the ability to coordinate the entire mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. behind the movement so it's more not, not like it's not about isolation it's more about integration yeah in exactly yeah, integration just, would sort of be the mm -hmm. the uh, comparison uh, the, the other side of the isolation okay. you know so from an from an athletic point of view I don't see a lot of value in isolation mm -hmm. from a aesthetic point of view there's there's probably a lot of value mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. although that's not where my interest lies you're one of the fittest men on planet earth according to men's health right so how did this happen and what's your most impressive feet lift or personal record well um, you know going back so this was I don't know eight eight years ago maybe that article came out mm -hmm. um, so men's health uh, basically and, and I had no uh, knowledge of this going into it so definitely there's some subjectivity to it because um, I think these were individuals that were s submitted mm -hmm. to the committee ah. And I so, wasn't even aware of it. it was, no, I wasn't aware until until, until it came right, out, uh -huh. and then I was informed about it. <laughs> okay, you know, so it, uh, there's no, there was no, um, there was no exam or, or something to qualify. It was a, a subjective measurement. Um, and you didn't apply it intentionally, right? Or, right, not just, at all. Uh, yeah. So basically, one of the writers for Men's Health submitted me as you know based on physical feats that that I've been able to accomplish in my, in my life and mm -hmm. um, you know so it was a, it was a nice um, I guess a feather in my cap type of thing I don't I don't consider <laughs> okay. it an, an accomplishment because it was it wasn't based on a competition or or a test it was just something that I was uh, bestowed upon me based on my reputation and based on but my, it was kind my of, body of work. And it was kind of a competition because you had footballers yeah, because, were in there. Yeah, you know, so, so there was a lot of famous of people on that list. Yeah. You know, I think they rated number one of all time was Muhammad Ali and Michael Jordan or and uh -huh. you know, one, one and two, one, Muhammad yeah. Ali, Michael Jordan. Yeah. And you had, you know, you had people like, um, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger was somewhere in there and, and you had, um, you know, some other, I probably Laird Hamilton was on that list and, and you know, uh, I think even Billy Blanks and, you know, there was some uh, fitness table. people. It was, a, yeah, it was a mixture. There was some uh, athletes, there was some yeah, fitness yeah. people. So it was, you know, who can really say, I, how can you compare Muhammad Ali to Michael Jordan, two different sports, two different you sports. know, so one's two great at what they do. Michael Jordan's great at something else. I'm great at what I do, but <laughs> there would never be an arena where you're competing against each other because you're. It's like trying to say that a, a baseball player compared to a soccer player, it's now, completely who, yeah, different. Who's the fittest? Or right. Who's the strongest? So, so yeah. when we talk about That's fitness right. in a real sense, you have to ask the question: Fit for what? So, 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 how are you measuring the fitness? Is it is it based on endurance? Well, the marathon runner would have the edge. Is it based yes. on you know, power, and then, then obviously the Olympic lifter is going to have the, you know, and they're both very high level at what mm -hmm. they do, but they're very, very different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see it more as a something that looks good on my resume, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm happy to have received that recognition, yeah. but it, there was no, there was no, um, I guess competition for it to to you know. Okay. So I could have been yeah. I could have been 90 or I could have been uh -huh. 80, and they just the way it ended up, I they put me at 89. 
of and, the and what, 100 fittest men of all time okay. is, was the list. And the reason they put you on, is this, has this something to do with, with your most impressive lift? Yeah, so for, what, I'm, what I'm most known for is the one-legged squat, you know, what, what, squat. yeah, the pistol yeah. squat, uh, you know, and I, I achieved a lot of recognition for that, um, especially the jumping. So I saw it on your Instagram. Yeah, so one of the authors that submitted, I think it was Alwyn Cosgrove, if, if I'm not mistaken, is the author that submitted um, mm -hmm. me on that list. And it was based on a demonstration that I did at, at a fitness uh, conference where I'm jumping up and down uh, on, you know, pistol onto a stage holding two kettlebells. Um, so probably my most impressive was, you know, and this is probably going back a decade ago, so it was a while ago. Okay. I'm not, I'm not training at that level in, in this lift mm -hmm. any longer. Okay. But um, <laughs> doing a, a pistol squat with with 80 kilos, so with 240. 240s. Kilo, yeah, and then doing three reps with 64 kilo on each leg, just on the ground. I just and on then the, the jumping body weight, jumping up and down I, on, that, onto that's a the body weight yeah, thing, three, right? three foot box okay. up and down. I, I, Which my most was seven or eight reps. So um, that's. And, Always staying on one leg. Yeah, staying right? on one leg. So one leg. Not losing balance. Not exactly. Losing power. Yeah, of course the balance and the strength and the flexibility mm -hmm. are all integrated mm -hmm. with that. So that's probably a physical feat that I'm most recognized for. Right. Right. Um, you know, as far as what the most impressive, you know, I, I, I guess it depends on who you ask, but probably mm -hmm. that would be probably the most impressive with physical the, feat with the two which it's such 40s. a unique it's such a it's a unique skill that mm -hmm. isn't very common so there's really no sport <laughs> that that measures or competes this <laughs> and the pistol squat in itself is, yeah is a hard yeah exercise, and most people right? would struggle to even do one yeah. with the body weight with and, the body you weight. know in my in my younger days of martial arts i was training 80 on each leg back to back without stopping so I was doing like sets of 160, 240s. You know, just just body weight. I, I just bought before ah, long right. before kettlebells reps, came reps, along. Ah, yeah. Reps. So now I'm 49 years old. But when I was when I was in my you know early 20s, I was I was doing you know sets of 50, 80s, 80 reps. Bam, bam, up yeah. and down, up right, and down. Exactly. Up and yeah. Down. So that's where I built the foundation. And then when I saw you know in the fitness community, people started calling these pistol squats. Doing it with kettlebells, I was like, oh wow, I used to do this all the time in my in my So back in the day it wasn't a pistol squat. It wasn't no, a single because leg squat. Actually, what? you know, actually it comes it's a martial art training because the idea is someone has your leg, you, you can kind of lower your center of mass to the ground and, and maintain your upright position, maintain your balance. In the Chinese martial arts they call it crane dip, because a crane is, you know, they stand on one leg. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's and oh, then, you know, somehow it was called Probably Pavel was the guy that started calling it the pistol. I'm not sure where that came from, mm -hmm. you know, but some some people says it, it kind of looks like Replicates a pistol. A pistol. Oh, so that might, yeah. but but actually the the movement itself has been around for oh. you know probably thousands of years, <laughs> okay. right? So Kuoshu is uh, you know there, there's it's known by different names. Uh, nowadays it's usually referred to as Sanda. Mm -hmm. uh, back when I was fighting, it's basically full contact martial arts, full contact kung fu specifically. So it's punching, kicking, and throwing on a boxing ring with no ropes. So part of the strategy is you, you try to knock the person out of the ring, predates MMA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, actually, there was a movie probably 15 or 20 years ago with Van Damme, it was called Blood Sport. Oh, that, of That's based on the sport of Kuo Shu or, or San Shao is another name for it. Kuo Shu is one name for it. Another name is San Shao. And in, in the modern times, they call it San Da. It's, so San it's, basically, it's basically kickboxing with throws uh -huh. on a ring without ropes.